All right, how y'all doing? I'm doing good. So, y'all get me tonight. Sorry for that. Uh, just kidding. No. All right. Um, so, y'all, do y'all remember what we're doing here? We're doing the Road. And, and we're taking a book and we're showing you how it points to Christ. Well, this week we're doing Ezekiel. And I'm going to be honest with you, this book was tough for me. It's a lot of material. Um, it's a lot of visions, a lot of prophecies, and uh, it's, it's a tough book. But there are, a lot of this book does point to Christ, and I, I hope that's what we're going to get to tonight, or that's my plan to get, you know, show you all that tonight. Um, so I'll go ahead and apologize in advance. Uh, I will be reading the resource that I got this from. I borrowed a lot of material. So it's going to be reading. If y'all can just stick with me. There's a lot of good stuff, okay? Uh, I do apologize because it will be a lot of reading. But um, I'm going to go ahead and get somebody to look up. Uh, let me see. It's, it's in chapter 1, verses 4 through 14, and we'll get to that in just a second. But Ezekiel, I'll give you a little bit of a background, maybe some history. Ezekiel was, was written by Ezekiel. Um, Ezekiel, was he, he's not mentioned anywhere else in Scripture. He was taken into exile to Babylon when he was 25 years old. After he was in Babylon for five years, um, that's kind of when he got the call from God to be a prophet. So Ezekiel, along with Jeremiah and Zechariah, uh, is a priest and a prophet. Um, His ministry, or his prophecies, lasted for 22 years. And um, because of of his priestly background, he was particularly uh, interested in the and familiar with the temple details. So God used him to give a lot of details about the temple in this book. And he is originated from the priestly family of Aaron. Do y'all remember who Aaron is? Brother of Moses. So he's, he's in that line, okay? So in chapter 1, Ezekiel has his first vision. And I'm, who, does anybody got 4, four through 14? All right. You're gonna be, you can read it, but be loud. All right. It's a, it's a long scripture. And this, we're going to see... Uh, the glory of God, how uh, Ezekiel sees it. Chapter 1, Chapter one verses 4 through 14. So where have we seen these type of visions before? Y'all remember? Revelation. Revelations. So who, who in Revelation saw visions like this? 
the glory of God like this? I heard it. Who said John. John. So <clears throat> the Ezekiel or Ezekiel's visions, a lot of the stuff that he sees is very similar to what John sees in Revelations. And we're going to see a couple of ties uh, here. But can y'all imagine what this is? This is these four creature, creatures, their wings are touching. They have a throne on them. And the, that, this represents the presence of God. And I wish I had time to go through all of this, but there's some other visions of, and it describes the, the wheels of this, of the, what the creature, the altar, or the throne is on the creatures, and they've got wheels with eyes all over them, and uh, so all of that represents God's glory. Um, in chapter 2, he is called, um, let's see, first, I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself, I need somebody to read now, verses, uh, chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, and this is where uh, Ezekiel's receiving his call, like I said, to be the, uh, the priest and the prophet. Somebody want to read for me? Sorry, Lydia. And he said to me, Son of man, stand on your feet, and I will speak with you. And he spoke to me. The Spirit entered into me and set me on my feet, and I heard him speaking to me. And he said to me, Son of man, I send you to the people of Israel, to the nations of rebels who have rebelled against me. They and their fathers have transfig transfigured against me this very day. The descendants also are... Impudent, impudent and stubborn. I send you to them, and you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord God. And, what if, and whether they hear or refuse to hear, for they, are rebellion, for they are a rebellious house, they will know that the prophet has been among them. And you, son of man, be not afraid of them, nor be afraid of their words. The barriers and thorns are with you, and you sit on scorpions, be not afraid of their words, nor be dismayed at their looks, for they have, for they are a rebellious house. And you shall speak my words to them, whether they hear or refuse to hear, for they are a rebellious house. But you, son of man, hear what I say to you. Be not rebellious like that rebellious house. Open your mouth and eat what I give you. And when I look, behold, my hand is stretched. A hand was stretched out to me, and behold, a scroll of a book was in it. And he spread it before me, and it had writing on the front and on the back. And there were written words on it, written words of lamentation and mourning and woe. Okay, so there's a phrase in here that he is calling Ezekiel. Uh, did it stick out to y'all the phrase that he was calling Ezekiel? What was he calling him? Son of man. Son of man. Who else have we heard referred to as son of man? Jesus. Jesus. So Ezekiel is being referred to as son of man and he's referred to Son of Man 90 times, or over 90 times uh, in the book of Ezekiel. And this is to highlight his mortality or his distance from God. When Jesus is called the Son of Man, it shows his closeness to us. And, it, and he's actually referred to the Son of Man, or he refers to himself as the Son of Man 85 times in the New Testament. So in chapter 3, Ezekiel is made a watchman. So chapter 2, he's called to be a prophet. Chapter 3, he is now being called, a wa uh, being called to be a watchman. So what do y'all think a watchman would do? Watch people. What does he watch for? Uh, we'll say trespassers, enemies, okay? So what a watchman would do is he'd literally stand on the wall and he'd watch for approaching enemies and warn the residents to muster up a defense. Ezekiel, Ezekiel's role was a spiritual watchman. He would give timely warnings for approaching judgment. This was Ezekiel's divine assignment. In the beginning of chapter 3, Ezekiel was told to eat a scroll. So again, who else was told to eat a scroll? John, John in what book? Revelation. Revelation. So uh, that's in Revelation 10, verses 9 and 10. The symbolic act of eating a scroll demonstrated that Ezekiel eternalized, or I'm sorry, internalized God's message in preparation for speaking to the people. Eating a physical, a physical scroll does not seem appetizing, but in this case, it tasted sweet like honey. And at the time, or at the time when it tasted sweet like honey, the message of the scroll contained uh, a lot of lament and woe. And that's in Ezekiel chapter 2. Um, <clears throat> and then we go on to chapter 4. Uh, Ezekiel sees the future capture of Jerusalem, and he uses visual signs to represent the, their destruction. And I've 
left off some stuff here. I'm not exactly sure where I was going with this. But in chapter 4, Ezekiel is told to take a brick and draw Jerusalem on the brick. And then he's told to put up siege walls around the brick. And all this is a representation. And he uses the iron skillet. And the iron skillet's put between Ezekiel and the, uh, the, the brick. And then he is told to lay on his side for 390 days. So who could lay on their, uh, that is his left side for 390 days. And then after he lays on his side for 390 days, he lays on his right side for another 40 days. So 430 days he's laid there and he's, um, he's bound up. He's, he's the scapegoat for Israel. And during this time, this is a kind of an interesting fact, he was actually told to cook his food, not in poop, but over poop. So he would actually use poop as the fuel to cook his food, okay? And so all of that was a sign of judgment that Israel was going to have to go through. Uh, Chapters 5, 6, and 7 are messages concerning judgment because Israel was more adulterous than the heathen countries surrounding them. Israel knew the one and true the one true God, and they chose to worship false idols anyway. So do y'all see how that makes them more heathens in the surrounding countries? Because they know the one true God, and they still chose to worship idols. Um, one of the reoccurring things of Ezekiel evol- or revolves around the phrase, and you will know that I am God. The best way to experience God is through an encounter with his mercy. At the same time, it is possible to experience God through an encounter with his judgment. At this point, God's people had sinned so much that they were about to experience the judgment of God in an encounter they would never forget. The reoccurring theme of, and you will know, testifies to the God-centeredness of this book. God's sovereignty, glory, and love for his people converge in a powerful way. This combination of ideas is also found in Jeremiah's prophecy. It certainly seems that Ezekiel drew upon Jeremiah to develop these ideas further by by focusing on on the Babylonians' destruction of Jerusalem. Um, Ezekiel 6 is full of uh, references, reference, I'm sorry, I can't say that word, is full of references to the theme of God's power and might for his people. In this case, God was dealing with a stiff-necked, rebellious people who would discover that, that he was the Lord through judgment. The emphasis is not necessarily on the fact that God judges, though That is certainly true. The real goal is that people would know and experience the character of God. This emphasis is getting to know God and experience God. Judgment is never for judgment's sake. Its goal is for people to experience more truth about who God is. So judgment is is a critical way for people to experience the character of God. The most wonderful part of the idea of judgment is that God substitutes Jesus for undeserving sinners. It was not until Jesus was lifted up on the crucifixion that people could really get to know him and understand him in the fullness or in the fullest sense so jesus said when you have lifted up the son of man then you will know i am he and that i do nothing on my own but speak just what the father has taught me that's in john 8 28 it is only through seeing that god substituted jesus for the sins of the world that people are able to see the truth that sets them free all right, I know we're kind of moving fast through this, guys, but there's so much material in Ezekiel, it's hard to get it all in uh, one lesson. Um, so chapter, we're going to move on to chapters 1, or I'm sorry, 8 through 11. And in chapters 11, we're going to touch on something, I'm going to see if y'all are familiar with it. Uh, Joe says you better be. Uh, so anyway, so in chapters 8 through 11, he has visions concerning the abominations in the city and the temple. So God's judgment was uh, coming upon the Israelites because of their sin. Their sin was not contained to a few people on the fringes of their community. Instead, the leaders of the community were committing it. So what this is saying here is it's not just a few people committing sins. It's everybody, even the leaders of Israel at that time are committing sins. And they're committing these sins in the temple, the very place where God's presence was meant to dwell with his people. They were committing wicked acts against God. So in chapter 10, God's glory leaves the temple. So again, uh, Ezekiel gets this vision of the glory of God that he had in the first chapter. 
and he sees the glory moving away from the temple. Um, and it says, but, uh, I'm sorry, God's glory in the temple was, manif- was a manifestation of his presence. But since sin was happening in the temple, God removed his presence. Beginning with Ezekiel 9.3, the prophet recounts the steady withdrawal of God's presence from the temple. The removal of God's glory was a shocking reminder that God was not going to tolerate the Israelites' sin. Thankfully, Jesus made a way for God's glory to remain with his people in a permanent way. Jesus was God's glory living on earth. That's in John 17, 24. But people did not see it. In times, Jesus' disciples realized that in Jesus' incarnation, death, and resurrection, they had witnessed the coming glory of God. Jesus came to live a perfect life and die as the perfect sacrifice for human sin. When God took the sins of the entire world and heaped it, Keep them on Jesus. Sin was accounted for and punished. As a result, believers can experience God's glory and live because their sin is no longer an obstacle to them. Ezekiel taught about the removal of God's glory, and Jesus taught about the coming of God's glory. So now we're in chapter 11, uh, and we're going to be kind of focused on verses 19 through 22 uh, and 23. God pledged not only to restore Ezekiel's people to their ancient land, but also to give the new covenant with its, with its blessings. So he's going to take their heart of stone and give them a heart of flesh. Have y'all heard that before? All right. So uh, God's glory, and we'll touch on that a little bit uh, later on in the book. Um, but God's glory left the presence of God's people because God's people, God's people were involved in their un- unrelenting sin. The idol worship uh, permeated everything to the point that they went to the temple to pay homage to the other idols. So y'all do realize what the temple is for, right? What is the temple for? Worshiping God. Worshiping God, okay? The one true God. So they have gotten so far into this idol worship that they're going to the temple to worship the one true God and they're worshiping other gods and they're even painting images of their idols and unclean animals on the walls of the temple, the very place where they're supposed to be worshiping God. Um, God's message to his people about their sin was clear. It was wrong. He told them to stop sinning. He warned them about its consequences. And he warned them that he would not tolerate it forever. God took the most precious thing that he could have from his people, his presence. Regardless of what God's people valued, God's glory was the best reality they had, had ever experienced. It is inter- interesting to note how God slowly removed his glory from his people. God's glory moved from above the cherubim in the most high place to the threshold of the temple. That's found back in chapters 9, verse 3. And then it moved to the east gate of the temple. That's Ezekiel 10, 19. And then uh, made one final stop above the Mount of Olives. That's Ezekiel eleven twenty three. 23. God slowly and re- reluctantly removed himself from his people with a display that left no doubt as to what was happening. Not long after God removed his glory from Solomon's temple, the temple was destroyed, and God's glory never returned to the temple. But God's glory did return to earth, and it returned in a way that was unlike anything the world had ever seen. John explains the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. So how would his glory come back? If the word became flesh, who is that talking about? Talking about Jesus. It says, we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. That's in John uh, chapter 1, verse 14. Jesus fully embodied the glory of God. To see God, one only needs to look to Jesus. Following his short life, Jesus offered himself up as the perfect sacrifice for sin to end all other sacrifices. He gave uh, parting words to his followers and departed to heaven from the Mount of Olives. His glory is with the people today because all who trust in Jesus possess the Spirit and live their lives reflecting God's glory in an ever, in an ever increasing way. So chapters 12 through 24 are explanations of these judgments that Ezekiel has been um, telling the people of Israel about. In chapter 12, God's prophet had to speak to God's rebellious people, a phrase that the Lord used twice in this verse. Uh, I'm actually going to read that verse so y'all can hear what he says. This is in chapter 12, verse 2. It says, Son of man, you dwell in the midst of a rebellious house. 
who have eyes to see, but see not, who have ears to hear, but hear not, for they are a rebellious rebellious house. Again, he uses that phrase twice in that verse. Um, The Lord used it twice in the verse to describe the community of the exiles in Babylon, among, among whom Ezekiel ministered. They refused to listen to the prophet's words or heed his dramatizations, sorry, I can't say that word either, uh, of their coming judgment. So again, what he did, that was pointing back to chapter um, 4 where he did the brick and he laid on his side. Um, And it says, Jesus was accused of being a rebel, but Jesus came to die for the rebels or sinners. And uh, he was crucified between two rebels. And God sent both Ezekiel and Jesus to speak to a rebellious people. Jesus was a perfect man who lived a life of perfect obedience to God for undeserving people. So we're going to move on to chapters 13 and 14. And God's rage burned against Jerusalem's false prophets. So Ezekiel was a prophet of God. And Israel had false prophets. So as Ezekiel was giving him the visions and telling them, Hey, this is what's going to happen for your sin. Um... These other prophets were telling him, were telling the people of Israel, no, there's peace. Um, what Ezekiel's telling you is not right. Like, y'all don't have to worry about this. We're prophets too. Everything's going to be okay. Uh, so God, uh, obviously wasn't true. These were not prophets of God. And God's rage burned against them. That is a scary sentence to read, to hear about God's rage burned against Jerusalem's false prophets. And it says these, these defeat, deceitful prophets Prophets gave God's people a false sense of hope, saying there was peace when there was no peace. God spoke through Ezekiel, saying God would crush these false prophets when the city was destroyed. Chapter 15, God's people were compared to a grapevine. And this grapevine did not produce fruit. So what do you think that you would do to a grapevine that does not produce fruit? Do what? Tear it down. down. Well, in this sense, they would use it for firewood. It says, Your vine, y'all are a vine, y'all are no, good for nothing but firewood. This is also seen in the New Testament in Mark chapter 11, when Jesus wanted to eat of the fig tree, but it had no fruit. So Jesus cursed it and it withered. Jesus encourages believers saying that he is the true vine to whom we must be attached in order to be fruitful. He says, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does not or every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful that's found in John chapter 15 in Ezekiel God's people failed to demand or depend on God and they withered away today the evidence of real Christianity a real Christian growth is found in the fruit that God's people bear so that others will see the hope that we have in Jesus and believe all right so skip Chapter 17 through 24, that's just more explanation of God's coming judgment to the people of Israel. Again, what's happening here is Ezekiel is given prophecies to tell the people of Israel to repent. The people of Israel continue to live in their sin and turn their back on God, and now their judgment is is coming. So in chapters 24, God wanted to show his people how much their sin hurt his heart. To do this, God told Ezekiel that he was going to lose, or God was going to take Ezekiel's wife. So how do you think that would make him feel if, if God took his wife? You think he might feel sad? You think he might mourn, cry? Um, he, and God refers to his wife as the delight of his eyes. And it says, in order to illustrate this for the people, how great a loss God felt over the loss of Jerusalem. So he takes Ezekiel's wife to show the people of Israel how great of a loss that they're going to feel. And um, it says, though the nation of Israel had been warned, their grief over the fall of Jerusalem would be unimaginable. Their conventional means of expressing grief would be insufficient for the great pain the exiles would feel. People express sorrow in different ways. A long period of mourning was normal response to the death of a loved one in the um, ancient east. It says there were certain things that mourners would do to illustrate their sorrow. So what would we do to illustrate our sorrow? Cry. Huh? Cry. Cry. Anything else y'all might do? Well, back in this time, what they would do is they would cry, they would weep, 
They would take off their turbans, they would put dust on their heads, and they would fast. Or they would do the opposite and eat the food of the mourners. And I kind of looked that up. The food of the mourners, what I found was bread that they would put salt on and dip in water. Um, uh, it says there were certain things, or I'm sorry, I already read that. It says Ezekiel was to do none of these things. So his wife is taken, and God told him, you're not to show any sorrow. You're not to cry over her. You're not to do any of what the normal mourning uh, rituals would be. Um, and Ezekiel's apparent indifference to the death of his beloved wife was a powerful object lesson to God's people about how they would feel in the future when they learned about the fall of Israel. Ezekiel reveals that God was about to administer a far greater calamity than the death of his wife. Jerusalem was going to fall. So their punishment for their sin was Jerusalem was about to be, uh, was about to fall and they were about to lose their temple. So when they lose Jerusalem, they lose their temple. And the temple was the, was the people of Israel. It was their delight of their eyes. Um, and it says, after this, the people who weren't killed were going to be taken to Babylon, joining Ezekiel and other Israelites already in exile. What made this worse was that many of the sons and daughters of those Ezekiel spoke to were going to be murdered in the process. The death of Ezekiel's wife points to, or points the reader to the death of the only, or the only truly innocent person who ever lived, Jesus Christ. People may be tempted to look at the death of Ezekiel's wife and call it unfair, yet if anything in the Bible is unfair, it is that Jesus died for people who did not deserve it. Paul explained that God, in, or what God intended through the death of his son. God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's Romans 5, 8. Jesus' death was a necessary death. No one could be saved without it. Do y'all understand that? Nobody can be saved without the death of Christ and his resurrection. Um, and God the Father allowed his son to die to show the depth of his love that he has for his children. Do y'all understand that? He allowed his son to die for you. All right, that's how much he loves you. He gave his son. And God is not heartless towards human pain. People may not always understand his ways, but his children can trust that he is working things for good for those who love him. Um, chapters 25 through 32 are prophecies against the surrounding countries of um, Israel or of Judah and if anybody or Jerusalem we'll say Jerusalem um, and if anybody had raised their hand against Jerusalem now God's going to punish them um, but we're not going to get into all those prophecies um, Ezekiel 34 1 through 24 we see that the shepherds are taking care of themselves instead of taking care of the people so what we're doing here let me back up a little bit so the leaders of Israel here are considered the shepherds. The people of Israel are considered the sheep. So God is talking to the shepherds here. Or he's telling Ezekiel to talk to the shepherds. Um, and, and he's saying that the shepherds are taking care of themselves and not the sheep. They're not feeding the sheep, they're feeding themselves. Um, and as a result, God gets involved. God became the personal shepherd of his people and tended their, uh, their needs himself. God makes many promises to his sheep. Uh, so we are his sheep, right? Yes? yes? Okay. So, but so he's talking, again, he's talking to the people of Israel at this time. And it says, God makes many promises to his sheep. He says he will search for, for and rescue them in times of trouble. He will lead them to good grass that will allow for flourishing. He will tend to their needs and give them strength when they are hurting and weak. Jesus is the good shepherd. He personally leads his sheep and delivers them from danger when they stray. Many good shepherds care for their sheep, but Jesus uniquely gave his life to save his sheep. Jesus' sacrificial death entitles him to be called the great shepherd. All right, so in Ezekiel 36, we're going to touch on the, what we touched on in uh, chapter 11 here. Um, it says... God was clear that his people's sin broke his heart. As a result of their sin, they were sent into exile. Many of their children 
were murdered, their city was overtaken, and their temple was destroyed. Again, this is when Jerusalem fell. It says, in the midst of their hopelessness, God sent a message of hope, and he would give his people a new heart, a new start, and most importantly, a new spirit. So that's chapter 36, verse uh, 26. God's people had a fundamental problem. They could not change themselves because they had hearts that were full of sin. Uh, to change their problem, God was going to have to change their hearts. He does not simply fix a, a small problem in the hearts of his prophets or the hearts of his people. He gives them a brand new spiritual heart. The problem was the sinful heart is that it is hard and unresponsive to correction and warning. That's the heart of stone. For those who trust in God or trust in Him, God removes that old heart and replaces it with a new one that is soft. It's tender. And it's responsive to God's uh, leading and guiding. That is the heart of flesh. Again, that's Ezekiel 36 and 26. The new heart won't resist in the same way the old heart did. The old heart was dead and the new heart is alive. Do you all understand that? So the heart of stone is dead. You are dead with the heart of stone. So God removes the heart of stone, gives you the heart of flesh, and now you are alive. He gives you a heart that is alive. Um, and it says to accompany the new heart God promises to fill his people with the very spirit of God in the Old Testament the spirit of God would come upon people from time to time but in the New Testament because of what Jesus accomplished uh, the spirit comes to live in people the change in how the spirit would be given under this new covenant would make all the difference Jesus made this same promise to his people that his spirit would live in them and guide them into all truth. Ezekiel 37, um, we get into this valley of the dry bones. Have any of y'all heard of the valley of dry bones? And know what happened in the valley of dry bones? Okay, so God, he's, he, it's, this is a vision, and God takes Ezekiel uh, on this journey around a valley of dry bones. So he's literally in the middle of a valley of bones. He's the only one alive. There's no life in these bones. The uh, I actually read one commentary that said that these bones were dry, which means they had been there a really long time. They've been dead for a long time. Um, <clears throat> and God asked Ezekiel a question, and he says, Son of man, can these bones live? What do y'all think Ezekiel's response would be? What would y'all's response be? I mean, how would these bones live? Okay. So, but Ezekiel actually responds, and he says, Sovereign Lord, only you know the answer to that question. Um, and it, then God gave Ezekiel the unthinkable directive. God told him to prophesy to the bones. So again, he's in a valley of bones. They're not alive. God says, prophesy to these bones so that the bones would come to life. It is one thing for God to bring the, the dead to life. It is quite another uh, for God to involve um, humans in the process. Ezekiel began to speak to the bones, and God worked through Ezekiel's words. So what do y'all think might happen to these bones if God is speaking through Ezekiel to the bones? The bones started to come back together. So can y'all imagine bones everywhere and all of a sudden they start, they just come back together. Then the bones are covered with tendons. They're covered with flesh. Um, and, he, and, he's, and it says Ezekiel marveled at the, resur at the resurrection that took place. At the end of this process, an entire army stood before Ezekiel awaiting God's command. Actually, before that, so <clears throat> the bones are together. They've got tendons. They've got muscles. They've got skin. Do you think that they were still, they were alive at this point? So even then, they were not alive. So now he was in the valley of bones everywhere. Now he is actually around a bunch of people who were not alive. So he tells him to prophesy again, and he prophesies the very breath of God into, these, uh, into this army that's awaiting God's command, and they come alive. So God did, God did this miracle to remind Ezekiel that his word is powerful and effective. This vision was to remind Ezekiel of God's power and promise to restore and revive a dead people. So who do y'all think that the dry bones represented in this? Us. Huh? Um, well, in this particular vision, it was to represent Israel. All right, because the Jerusalem had fallen, the temple had fallen, 
So God is using this to, rep, or to show Ezekiel that he's going to give life back to his people. Um, and it says, God's word has incredible effects. It brings the dead to life. As God's word is proclaimed, the Spirit of God uses the, uses the word of God to revitalize the people of God. Jesus told his followers that their only hope was to depend on him in every way. God's word allow, God's word always does what he intends. Um, all right, is I, Isaiah 55, 11 says, So in my word that goes out from my mouth, it will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. God's word can bring light into darkness and life into dead places. Um, let's see, the chapter uh, 43 uh, the glory of God left the temple. Y'all remember that back when we talked about that? Glory left the temple because they were sinning. So in chapter 43, verses 1 through 12, the glory returns to the temple. The vision of the return of God's glory to the temple is one of the high points of the book of Ezekiel. On its return, the glory of God not only fills the temple, it even causes the land itself to shine. That's found in verse 2. Without the presence of God at the heart of a community, there can be no life at all. There will simply be a collection of dry bones. Ezekiel's vision of the return of God's glory is a picture of what must happen before people can be restored. God's, present, God's presence must arrive for healing to take place. This vision gives readers a picture of the future city of God when his glory will be revealed and there will be no need for the sun. That's found in Revelation 22.5. It also points toward the time when God himself would live inside his people and reside in, the, reside in the temples that he has made them to be. In both the present and future, God dwells with his people. By dwelling with them, God will make all things new. He lives within his believers today through, this, through his spirit. He will gather all people who love him to himself one day in the future. Uh, so now we move on to chapter 48. This is the last chapter, and um, this is the last vision that Ezekiel is given. From the very beginning, God's plan has been to have a pure and permanent relationship with his people. Ezekiel's final vision is one of the city in which this will happen. And the name of the city is the Lord is there. The prophet saw 12 gates surrounding the city, representing the 12 tribes of Israel. Uh, the apostle John later saw similar gates in his vision in the New Jerusalem. That's in Revelation 21. Now, both visions foreshadow the physical presence of the Lord in the future. Um, uh, let's see. I'm sorry, I misread that. But it says both visions foreshadow the physical presence of the Lord in the future, perfect city where God and his people will live in eternal harmony. Um, Revelation 21 3 summarizes this theme, uh, and it says, And I heard a loud voice. From the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. God has always desired a permanent relationship with his people and God will have and will have it. Jesus Christ made this relationship with God possible by dying on the cross to remove the sin barrier that separated people from God. Jesus then secured the presence of God for his people by rising from the dead to bring his people to God. Um, I got through that really quick. Uh, do y'all have any questions? Let's take a time to see if y'all got any questions or anything we went over. And I'll try to answer them. Um, I'll even ask Joe, do y'all have, any, have anything to add or correct anything that I said wrong if I did? Um, all right, well, then well, we'll just, we'll pray and I guess you, can you get back up and sing a few more songs? Okay. All right. Lord, uh, we do come to you tonight. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to be here. Lord, I ask that everybody in this room um, can somehow receive something that I went over tonight, Lord, through the, the reading. Lord, I know that that's tough to listen to, uh, someone read that long, Lord. Um, but I ask that you use what we went over tonight, Lord, and just, um, I just reveal yourself to all these students in this room, Lord. And Lord, we ask that you just make yourself known to them. Lord, we do ask that you will um, recall to our memories, Lord, that, that we all need the heart of stone removed and receive the heart of uh, flesh, 
Lord. And uh, again, we thank you for the opportunity to be here. I ask that you be um, with each student as they go back to school and whatever that looks like, Lord, if they're going, if they're homeschooled or if they go to public school, we ask that you be with them and the relationships that they have uh, with the people they come in contact with, Lord. We ask that they just be a light for you and um, then just shine for you, Lord. And again, we just thank you for everything that you do for us in Jesus' name. Amen.